These are African rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit. From WSNC 90.5 FM, a broadcasting service and NPR affiliate of Winston-Salem State University, welcome to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, an exploration into the impact of the death of Mariela Franco, state violence, and the future of resistance in Black Brazil and the African diaspora. Africa World Now Project is next. viver na favela, outra coisa é você reivindicar e usar desse lugar de favelada para estar tá fazendo política de outra maneira. Eu, sou, eu fui aluna de pré-vestibular comunitário em 98, eu fui da primeira turma aqui do Praia da Maré. Foi o ano One que eu engravidei, eu tenho uma filha na favela. Anos. Another thing is for you to claim and use this location as a favelada and do politics differently. I was a student in the community-based college prep course. In 1998, I was part of the first class in Praia de Maré. It was the year that I got pregnant. Today, I have my daughter, who's 17 years old. I was trying to avoid being a statistic. Not in the beginning, but afterwards, I was trying not to be a statistic. Am I being able to raise Luara? I'm being able to change my perspective on life. I was a teenage mother, so I had to leave the prep course. From 2000 onward, I've been working in organizations in Maré, doing social projects focused on favelas, with culture, with education. This place that, yes, is marked by violence from every direction, today we are exposed to oppression that oftentimes makes us say that we are not complicit in this. We do not have to normalize the police going into the favelas with their lights on or leaving the favela to hear public security forces say that they haven't killed anybody yet. So we are going to go inside of the favelas. We're going to enter and leave. We're going to put our faces out there. And this is one of the things that makes me proud. We are together, collectively putting on the table discussions about favelas, gender, in this city that is so exclusionary. Today, my politics focus on three pillars for the campaign, the gender debate, the racial debate, and debates around blackness and sexuality. Who are these black women who are in the favelas? Their children, their struggles, the kinds of work they are doing. I'm working with this trilogy of race, gender, and the city. The women who today are in Maré are not yet involved in the discussions around trans, hetero, these binaries. I think that the feminist movement needs to put these ideas such as abortion, women's bodily autonomy out there. But we also need to talk about daycare, about the place of women in the favelas, about how these women are vulnerable and live in the violence. For example, with the feeling of being exposed to certain kinds of violence how this beats them down. I want to make my politics centered around the question of gender. It's in this perspective of dialogue that you are able to understand what is the role that we are going to play with the state. Today, this is, a centra this is central for my conceptualization of the idea of women's affect and sensibility. It is not a wishy-washy approach. It's being firm. It's an understanding of this broader process that I want to put out there. On the evening of Wednesday, March 14, 2018, Mariela Franco, a city councilor for Brazil's Socialism and Freedom Party, PSOL, was killed as she was riding in a car in Rio de Janeiro. Reports suggest that a cobalt model car pulled up beside her and fired 13 bullets into the vehicle. The bullets killed her and her driver. Franco's press secretary, who was in the back seat with her, survived. According to an article titled, Who Killed Mariela Franco in Jacobin Magazine, Currently, evidence suggests that Franco's death was in fact a well-planned political execution. Before Mariela Franco was murdered, she had attended an event earlier that evening in Rio's La Pa neighborhood called Black Women Changing Power Structures. On Friday, March 16th, suspicions about the source of the murder deepened when reports emerged that the bullets that killed Franco and Gomez were from an allotment sold to Brazil's federal police in 2006. 
The same allotment had been used in a 2015 police operation in Sao Paulo that killed 17 people, earning the distinction of the worst slaughter in the history of Sao Paulo State. Three military police and one civil guard were convicted in the killings. On Franco's website, it opens with this sentence. My name is Mariela Franco. I am a woman. I am black. I am a mother and I am a child of the Marie Favela. In this sentence, one can find the essence of Franco's political life and the renovation of grassroots politics she sparked in Rio de Janeiro. Born and raised in the Marie Favela in the city's north zone, Franco began working at the age of 11 years old to pay for her education. During her youth, a close friend of hers was killed by a stray bullet, the result of crossfire between police and traffickers. That moment set her political life in motion, making her into a passionate campaigner for the demilitarization of Rio de Janeiro's police and for the human rights of black Brazilians and favela residents. While working and raising a daughter as a single mother, she pursued bachelor's and master's degrees, ultimately defending a dissertation that criticized police pacification campaigns in Rio's largest favelas. She wrote, the police state is aimed at the repression and control of the poor. The most emblematic mark of this picture is the militaristic siege in the favelas and the growing process of incarceration. She goes on to argue that the campaigns work to contain the dissatisfied or excluded of this process. The majority of them poor and increasingly relegated to the city's ghettos and in prisons. Every year, Brazil's police are responsible for at least 2,000 deaths. The victims are generally recorded as having been killed while resisting. The exact phrase used varies from state to state. Usually few, apart from the victims' families, take much notice, even when their circumstances are highly suspicious. For example, where the fatal wound suggests the victim was in fact running away when shot, or even kneeling. Moreover, it is rare that a police officer is suspended for a killing, rarer still for one to be charged or tried. These victims are predominantly Brazilians of Afro descent as well as the poor. A report from Amnesty International offers a harsh critique of the heavy-handed policing tactics in the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro, once again bringing intense scrutiny to a long-running issue in the country. In this report titled, You Killed My Son, Homicides by the Military Police in the City of Rio de Janeiro, it was found that Rio's military police habitually use excessive force during security operations in the city's favelas and regularly commit extrajudicial killings. Between 2005 and 2014, there are 8,466 documented cases of registered police killings in the state of Rio de Janeiro. Of these cases, 5,132 of them occurred in the city of Rio de Janeiro, with the number of police killings in the city representing nearly 16% of all homicides in 2014. It is 2018. It is certainly reasonable to suggest that these numbers have risen. That report also found evidence suggesting police frequently alter crime scenes either by planting evidence or removing bodies without due diligence. Of the 1,275 registered homicides conducted by on-duty police between 2010 and 2013, 99.5% of the victims were men, 79% were black, and 75% were between the ages of 15 and 29 years old. Today, Africa World Now Project will bring you a recent conversation between Dr. Keisha Khan Perry and Dr. Vera Benedito that explored the deep implications of the recent death of Mariela Franco. Examining the origins of Franco's politics rooted in fighting for a radical change in Brazil's social, political, and economic structures and mapping the future of Brazil's black radical left, Keisha Khan and Professor Benedito provides an important context of global violence in the African world. Initially trained as a journalist and literary critic, Dr. Benedito was a founding member of the Black Movement in Sao Paulo. She was recruited by the late Ruth Sims Hamilton at Michigan State University in the 1990s to complete her master's and a PhD in sociology. She was an inaugural contributor to the African Diaspora Research Project that brought together scholars and activists from around the world to carry out collaborative and comparative research on black culture and politics. The late Minister of Racial Equality, Luza Barraros, was part of that cohort of students at Michigan State who, along with Dr. Benedito, profoundly shaped African diaspora studies in the United States. She has written on the history of Caribbean labor migration to Brazil, as well as the complex political history of the struggle for affirmative action in higher education and in the labor markets. She went back to Brazil in the mid-2000s, where she has worked as a teacher and administrator in the public school system while also training teachers to implement Afro-Brazilian and African history into the curriculum. Dr. Benedito has spent the last decade producing pedagogical materials, specifically books and training manuals, and much of her academic writings have focused on education policy from a legal perspective. She has also written extensively on Afro-Brazilian literature and intellectual histories that will inform much of the textbooks she authored. 
In addition to being the newest member of the African World Now Project Collective as an associate producer, Dr. Keisha Khan Perry is an associate professor of Africana Studies at Brown University, where she specializes in the critical study of race, gender, and politics in the Americas, with a particular focus on black women's activism, urban geography, and questions of citizenship, feminist theories, intellectual history, and disciplinary formations, and the interrelationship between scholarship and political engagement. She has conducted extensive research in Mexico, Jamaica, Belize, Brazil, Argentina, and the United States. Professor Perry is also author of Black Women Against the Land Grab, The Fight for Racial Justice in Brazil. Today's program was executive produced by Keisha Khan Perry and, as always, in solidarity with the Native, Indigenous, African, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all people. Enjoy the program. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Vera Benedito um, in conversation with us about the current happenings in Brazil, um, specifically in the recent weeks after the assassination of Councilwoman um, Marielle Franco in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we wanted to talk more about the impact um, of, of what is going on in the country locally as well as nationally and we wanted to get uh, the perspective of a scholar and activist that has been talking about these issues for decades um, and writing about this um, in her scholarship and in her and doing activism around these particular issues around anti-black violence um, that is gendered and, and um, classed in the country. So welcome, Dr. Vera, Vera Benedito. Hi. Okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Tisha and Sir Jane. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So we just wanted to begin the conversation by asking you about what's happening in Brazil. We know that we've witnessed a tremendous amount of mourning related to the assassination of Maria Franco and Anderson Gomez. Um, and there's been a lot of public outrage that has been quite immediate uh, and also garnered a lot of national and international attention. So, but I wanted you to give us your perspective on why do you think that this particular execution of a black woman politician, why it has sparked such a strong response um, locally, nationally, and internationally? Yes. Um, actually, the, death, the assassination of Marielle Franco and Anderson Gomez is this another episode of racial violence that's taking place in Brazil, not just today, but over the past few decades. And now, uh, the situation of racial violence is escalating into a level that is just like uh, threatening the security, threatening the uh, level of democracy in this country. Um, the assassination of a black woman politician uh, is one of the top issues right now in the country related to gender, race relations, uh, racial uh, orientations, uh, sexual orientations, and all kinds of issues related to inequality. And over the past uh, few years, actually, a year and a half, Almost 200 politicians in the country have been assassinated in one way or the other. So, for one thing, Brazil is going through a state of violence. Secondly, when we take into consideration that over the past uh, five years, more than 6,000 uh, youngsters between 15 and 24 years old have been assassinated every single year, and 78% of those youngsters are black youngsters. That means we are living what Abidias Nascimento a long time ago has mentioned about genocide, black genocide in this country. And this is not particularly to Brazil. 
every single country that has a history of slavery, racial violence, uh, state violence, that is what's going on today in every single country in uh, um, South America, Caribbean, where the majority of people are black people, and the U.S., and other places where you see uh, an increasing number of uh, black people, you see the increasing number of killings, killing field. So it is a way that we do not know what's going to happen in the next, next uh, few months. This year, particularly, is an electoral year. We are going to vote for president, for congressmen, councilmen, and, and so forth. And in terms of politics, we have been through a lot of uh, uh, issues of destabilization, uh, corruption, and accusations. We had the impeachment of uh, President Dilma Rousseff. And what's taking place in the, in the background is a change in the political project for the country. And this is being uh, uh, done in a such a violent way that violence became pretty much naturalized in this country. And we have to watch out. People are mobilizing in different levels. But for one thing that was very, very, very uh, uh, interesting was the assassination of Marielle Franco and Anderson Gomes in a way that nobody could expect. Every single city in this country is stopped for a day or two in protest march, saying we can no longer take that. And it doesn't mean that that was a major issue that happened, so the killings stopped for a while, and okay, we are thinking about it. No, the following day, children of one year old had been killed by, you know, errant bullets. So, in, and three days later, five youngsters in a uh, pretty much middle class, uh, lower middle class condominium in Rio de Janeiro, Marica, five of them, they were doing nothing, they were killed. So, something has to be done in a way. And it's escalating. Social movements are beginning to, you know, regroup and try to do something about it because we no longer can take that anymore. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want you to talk in thinking about the impact of um, the assassination of uh, Marielle Franco and Anderson Gomez. And I think you're right um, in terms of framing it within a broader kind of anti-black genocide um, that is taking place, right? That has taken place before she is killed and is taking place after and on this kind of genocidal continuum across mm -hmm. the centuries, right? Um, that has escalated mm -hmm. in recent um, time that is profoundly um, shaped, that has profoundly shaped the project of what some have called kind of the extermination of black youth in the country, right? So I think I wanted you to talk a little bit more about this is it, it's happening on the everyday. Um, even folks like Marielle is comment on commenting on it. Um, she was commenting on it on Twitter and other spaces. But there's something else that happens in this moment that says, you know, we have to kind of take action, right? I want I want to get your um, response in you know, on a personal level, I think a lot of folks have been coming out with kind of thinking about what is this happening now for social movements, but how do you think this was impactful in terms of to you as a black woman who has been an activist over um, decades? Um, what are some of the, the stories and narrative you've been hearing um, from people about how it has personally kind of impacted them um, in a way um, in terms of moving forward? I can say that over the past 30 years, there has been an empowerment of black women around the country. Black feminist movement, uh, LGBT movement, um, and a new generation of youngsters coming from uh, communities, poor communities, that thanks to the 
kind of affirmative action in uh, public universities as well as public universities. A lot of them have been able to get into uh, the university level and get some education. And some of them, like Marielle, she decided also to do something for her community, not only study the community, but do something in terms of public policies for the community. And in all levels of uh, empowerment, whether based on uh, uh, women's movement, whether gender movement, whether based on uh, sexual orientation movement, whether based from, from uh, poor communities. So she, she uh, incorporated all these different dimensions in one single person. And that, is, that was too much. It's a new voice trying to, to do politics in a way that could be accountable. So uh, from what I could understand and learn after her assassination, one of the things that she was doing every single week was to go into the public uh, square in Rio de Janeiro and to talk to, to the public and to the passerby and explaining what she was doing in the council. So that gave her a kind of uh, legitimacy that was unknown and unheard of. That gave her a different uh, edge into the politics that in a place that is pretty much uh, dominated by uh, interest groups, uh, militia groups, you know, that voice was too strong, and she was just silent. After, what, two weeks after her, her death, nobody knows who did this. Up to now, it's all secrecy. Nobody can find anything. So it is like another life. It's like um, some people say, well, one thing that was particularly distressing was to, to read the comments uh, in, the, in the media, in the social networks. Uh, for one, she was openly uh, sexually oriented in a way. Uh, people were saying, well, you know, uh, black lesbians should die anyway. And after the incident was uh, assassination, Three different incidents took place in three different universities here in, in Sao Paulo. Very good universities with a lot of graffiti in the doors of the bathrooms, like, you know, the black lesbians should die anyway. So you see a mix of uh, poly politics, homophobic, and, and everything that could not take place in this country. We had only 30, 32, 33 years after the demise of the military from the government. We thought that we are going through a new level of democracy where all voices could be heard. And yet, in few years, that just evaporated. And what we see, the more you see new generation coming up, speaking up, against the inequalities, against the injustices in this country, their voices have been silent. And it is a kind of, you know, a continuum what has been taking place in the history of Brazil since the emancipation, 1888, where um, after that, black people were left out without any uh, uh, social policies in place that could, you know, level their uh, uh, level of education in terms of well-being, in terms of health, in terms of everything. So since then, it's like it's consistent. This direct or indirect form of genocide in this country has been consistent over the past 128 years. So that makes me wonder what's going to happen in the next four, five years to come. So we are in, a, in, a, in that particular dangerous 
place where either we take the moment, uh, the symbolic moment, with the assassination of Marielle, and we try to reframe the social policies of this country geared toward everybody in a level that people can really participate, that their voices can be heard, or we are going really into the barbaric sense of, you know, chaos, social chaos. If we do not have, you know, the participation of the of people in general in every single sector, I do not know what can happen. Uh, Marielle, for you, as you just said, uh, represented a new political moment, right? Um, a certain kind of political optimism among young people who are going to university, um, who are attempting to participate in the public sphere and change um, the narrative as well as the practices of kind of um, inclusion, um, social inclusion um, in Brazil on the, um, across the board. Um, what, I, what I'm curious to hear you talk more about is you've been an activist for, for decades. What do you think is particularly um, distinctive about this generation of um, political activists, especially black political activists? Why is um, the, you know, the Marielle Francos of Brazil um, so dangerous? Um, that they require a certain kind of um, uh, kind of a certain kind of silencing, right? Um, that they have to be killed in essence. So I just want I want to think about what is so distinctive about this particular um, generation of activists um, and politicians that are so dangerous um, right now. Yes, what I can say when I started uh, my activism with uh, at the university. My, the concern of my generation was that we were just discovering the sheer numbers of black people in this country. We didn't know a lot about our history, what were our real contributions to the making of this country. So for decades, we were trying to do not only the social, but also the cultural and educational activism that could inform the new generation about what we have been done in this country that were not in the uh, official textbooks and everything, uh, things like that. And also, uh, another branch of the black movement were pretty much engaged in, into the politics, not so strongly about party politics. So the generation of Marielle is a generation that entered the university with a better sense of themselves, you know, with a high self-esteem about who we are as a people. Our contributions that were great and we can make even better than that. So if we have a new generation of people who are they, are, they are not just beginning to discover, you know, their places in this society. They know already where they're coming from and what they want for uh, the society as such. Social inclusion, they want recognition, they want respect, and they just have the, they just want the plain level field. That means that the, the generations Marielle, they are a step uh, forward than us. So they are not just looking, you know, what we have to do for people to recognize who we are. They are just straight into the realities of their lives, the place where, from where they are coming from and what they can do about it in terms of training the people. For instance, Marielle, she was not just a councilwoman just uh, being elected because she had all the different agendas that she was pushing it. She was educating uh, a, a people to be participants in the political process, and that is real adventure. You know, when you see young people discuss 
discussing, you know, their places in an equal uh, level as, you know, uh, older politicians, people really get scared. Particularly that we have a, a religious right, very strong in terms of politics in this country. And Marielle represented a kind of challenge to all of them, to all the conservative forces in this country. For one, this is the first time that we had seen um, a black, intelligent uh, woman talking about her sexual preference. She didn't have to be talking about every single day, but she had a, a presence. She knew where she stands for. She was talking about, you know, poverty, what to do about poverty. You know, we can change that. So she was not just talking like, you know, doing propaganda about what to do. She was teaching people what to do about it. So that's another level of, politi of politics. You know, you, just, you not only tell people, but you teach them, you know, here are the facts. Here are the realities. Here are the, 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 the mass of information that you need to go about, to vote, and to change the situation. That is really dangerous, really dangerous. It has always been the case, and more so now than ever. You are listening to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. We are exploring the impact of the recent death of Mariala Franco, state violence, and the future of resistance in black Brazil. Africa World Now Project collective member and associate producer Dr. Keisha Khan Perry is in conversation with Dr. Vera Benedito. Dr. Benedito has written extensively on the history of Caribbean labor migration to Brazil, as well as the complex history of the struggle for affirmative action in higher education and in the labor market. After returning to Brazil in the mid-2000s, she has worked as a teacher and administrator in the public school system while also training teachers to implement Afro-Brazilian and African history into their education curriculum. Dr. Benedito has spent the last decade producing pedagogical, specifically books and training manuals, and much of her academic writings have focused on education policy from a legal perspective. Our show was produced today in solidarity with the Native, Indigenous, African, and Afro-descendant communities of Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Amalan Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all people. Enjoy the rest of the program. <laughs> female politicians who are like her um, around the country? What is the, the collective sentiment about, you know, how other kind of politicians were very similar to her? Or a lot of these grassroots activists who go into formal politics, um, do you think that this will caution, this will be, a, um, people will be more cautious about going into po um, formal politics? What do you think is the, the, the consequence of this in terms of motivating more of these activists to go into um, political parties and participate in formal politics? Well, what I have seen is a national mobilization at a lower level, actually. You know, it's not a mass mobilization, but people everywhere in every single state are promoting uh, debates, are discussing the situation. The, the danger is to transform the, the, this tragic event into political campaigns. Like Marielle, a lot of other people have been killed, talking, discussing uh, into the realities. But one thing that is really powerful, in a sense, is that older organizations, black women's organizations, are promoting throughout the year, uh, massive in important debates in, in partnership with major institutions. For instance, in Sao Paulo this month, in the 5th uh, of April and also 19th of April, uh, Sesc Villa Mariana is a very uh, important uh, social institution here. Uh, in Sao Paulo and also in Brazil, 
is promoting one uh, a very interesting agenda of discussing with uh, older generation of black militants and bringing also new militants to exchange views and opinions about the political process, about what's going on here in Brazil with the conservative movement everywhere, but also linking it into the other conservative movements that similar, similar things are taking place, not with the dimension of the black killings that is taking place in Brazil, but everywhere there is movement. People are rethinking their strategies, what we should do. And that's a very interesting moment, even if people are not just, you know, taking that as a political uh, so feel it, it's interesting that people think about it. This is electoral year. There's an opportunity to make sense. There's an opportunity to identify what are the politicians who really are defending a political project of equality, of anti-racist uh, uh, movement and, and issues like that. So who are really promoting uh, social inclusion in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of uh, every, every representation in, into the society? So it's a key moment. It's a key moment. I think that from now on, as, as, as we heard a lot uh, about the generations of militants talking about Lelia Gonzalez, talking mm -hmm. about Luisa Baez, talking about other people, the Beatriz Nascimento, people who were key to inform a generation of activists to think about their reality. So Marielle is part of this group that is going to bring some kind of change, qualitative change to our social struggles. I just had a quick question um, in the context of Marielle's politics, but also what we consider to be, or what couldn't be considered to be, I guess, the black left. Does Marielle, and you're, you're, you're describing, you know, the, the, the change and the evolution from your generation and how she's carrying it on. Does she represent, or did she represent, or could she be the face of the black left in Brazil? Or can she stand as a archetype of the politics, grassroots politics, radical politics of the black left. Precisely that. I think you got the point. Yes, she represents the black left movement. She represents the black uh, grassroots radical movement in, in Brazil. Definitely so. That's why she was so different. Um, as a follow-up to that, um, you know, I'm thinking about the black communist scholar and activist um, Claudia Jones, who wrote extensively about how um, uh, these kinds of grassroots activists or black women workers on the margins, and in the case of Rio would be in the favelas, represented um, a certain kind of militancy that um, was taking place on the left of the left, right? So she actually, um, to follow up um, from your previous statement, she was also ch not just challenging the right in Brazil and the conservative politics of the right, but she was also challenging the politics of the left that had not really um, adequately dealt with um, questions of racism, questions of anti-black um, and anti-indigenous genocide, um, so, and also even questions even around sexuality. So I wanted you to talk a little bit more about what it would mean uh, what, do, what does it mean for Marielle Franco to represent the left of the left and really um, represent a unique kind of political position in, um, for black activists? Yeah, I think that one uh, phrase that could be summarized to the place Marielle, yes, she was the left of the left. Um, we, may, uh, we should just recall... Uh, another uh, black activist, uh, Sueli Carneiro, that is attributed to her, that she said the following, between the left and the right, I continue to be black. Mm. 
which is, is to say, regardless of the ideological and political orientation, uh, either the left and the right, uh, during a long time, they, uh, they disconsidered uh, the place of race into the reality of Brazil. That means racism, race relations was just downplayed. You know, everything was about class, not about race. So if you have money, you can just easily go everywhere and be very nice and happy in this society. And Marielle was in the, in, is the left of the left, as James uh, uh, well said. Because it doesn't matter if you are um, very articulated, well-educated, be in the left, and yet you carry on uh, an entire population uh, behind you. You know, we just need to think for one moment from where Marielle came from. She, she came from the community of Mare, uh, major uh, uh, favela in Rio de Janeiro. And we have to think this, consider this. Almost 100 million Brazilians do not have sewage system. They go about without sanitation. Even in the major city as Sao Paulo, 46% do not have adequate housing or sanitation. And mostly, mostly of the people are black. So you got to be really on the left of the left as Marielle is representing all, all the different levels, the different uh, the differences within the difference, the differences within the inequality of Brazil. So I think she was pretty much clear on that. You know, she was not fooled by, you know, either you have to be right or, 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 or left. She understood both, and she just moved a step beyond. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we need more people to be like Marielle, uh, uh, politicians to be like Marielle, to move beyond and to look into the people they represent. And that's what she did. You know, it goes beyond left and right, I think, at this moment. But it's the left and the left and the grassroots level, uh, the radical grassroots level, definitely. It's in the same thing, uh, Professor uh, Kisha. The thing that you just wrote about uh, regarding black women against the land grab, you know, what makes the people to come about to fight for justice, for, to fight for their social standing in the society is the conditions of their reality that move them to pull, to, to forward, you know, to try to reframe that reality, to transform that reality in qualitative ways. And it's no difference. Like Marielle, I am so sure that we have hundreds of them around the country doing their work in particular communities. Not all of them are represented in the uh, uh, official party politics, but they are there. They are the strong voices that keep those communities together and fighting for, for justice. So, but it's a big moment, you know, it's a big moment. Uh, Marielle uh, should not be that way, but she also, uh, she touched in every single heart of black women in, in this country. And uh, speaking about uh, black women in this country, we have to remember that uh, Winnie Mandela just died today. Yes. So it's another way also to referring to a strong woman for that for years. Uh, I'm not judging, you know, it's right or wrong, you know, but she fought for justice, racial justice. So we have to think about that too. Mm -hmm. Right. So Marielle is, is among all those women in diaspora, in the diaspora, uh, in also in Africa, who are um, struggling for justice, is struggling for social representation, is struggling for uh, respect, is struggling for having their humanities being heard, 
it doesn't matter which stand they are taking, you know, but they are doing that. So it's a big moment and a sad moment at the same time. One of the things that uh, Marielle Franco made me think about um, is precisely how um, these kinds of women, and as you said before, I've done this work with um, women, black women who are organizing in neighborhoods. Um, I think for a lot of us in the diaspora who, you know, who, you know, people like myself who've done this work and the connections with folks I have in grassroots movements, one of the reasons why I was so touching was because we, I know so many more, you know, Marielis, right? There are so many mm-hmm. others who are doing the everyday labor of maintaining communities, of fighting to improve communities, and certainly mm-hmm. have been encouraged to go into politics. Right. Um, how many of these yeah. activists, neighborhood activists that are fighting for housing and land in Salvador, for example, mm-hmm. have been encouraged to go to become council uh, men, council women. Right. So there are a lot of them now that are thinking, um, you know, about their own position in, in politics beyond um, their neighborhoods and what that means to kind of take um, to do that work um, and the danger of doing that work. And I think that's what was so um, touching as well as her strong belief that there was a certain kind of um, militancy that came from people on the margins, right? That came from a position of marginality that she actually, I mean, she said, it's not just, you know, to look at, you know, not just that you're giving your votes from the favelas, but that the favela itself was a particular kind of politics. Right, um, and that it generated oh, yeah, political yeah. ideas that were not being addressed or not being talked about in political parties. So there was something else that was particularly kind of unique about that to say, no, there's a there's a militancy that exists on um, in these marginalized spaces, geographic as well as social and economic mm-hmm. um, spaces. Right. Yes, we cannot in this context of people uh, coming from the margins. We cannot forget about uh, Benedita da Silva, who uh, built a career, a political career, coming from those communities in Rocinha, and up to this day, she's still in politics. You know, it's, it's a different kind of politics, but still, she uh, uh, gave voice to people from those communities. And everywhere you go, you find women, you know, uh, looking for... Uh, ways to represent themselves as human beings in every single social context. Mm -hmm. And Marielle was one of those. You know, she represented that community. She never shied away from where she came from. You know, she actually, she, she, she had a voice. She had a place from where she was talking about and people could understand, could, uh, uh, perceive the legitimacy of her voice and also uh, trying to think with her, you know, what would be the utopia, what would be the new reality that we can draw upon us. It's so, uh, it's so uh, symbolic when we think about it that she just came out. She was happy with her life. She, was, she just came out out of a meeting with other black women discussing with them, you know, politics and ways of uh, being pretty much, you know, um, uh, as a a model to their own communities. She came out of that particular meeting. Yes, in one moment, the assassination of her could be send a message, you know, you know, just don't do too much because you cannot move forward because, you know, Conservatives, people are, you know, just watching you. But yet, at the same time, uh, the voluntary mass uh, protest that took place in, ent- in the entire country, it tells you something else. More people are listening. More people are paying attention, regardless of the assassination, regardless. So it is a, is a, is a new moment into the uh, uh, gender politics and the feminist, black feminist movement. And we are just watching it. Uh, this week, I will be par- part of the, 
this conference uh, that Gila Bez is promoting is important. She's bringing the old voices of black movement and also in the 19th of April because it's important to, to understand our past but understand our present, where we are, what we can do, how we can, you know, form a, a mass of solidarity among ourselves and also with all the movements uh, similar to ours in the diaspora. It's important not to just think that we are just unique in the sense of, in terms of uh, the miseries that are taking place in our uh, communities. We have to be able to come across. We have to understand that we are part of the same process. Um, I'm going to um, thank you so much for that, and I'll end by asking a, a one more question. Um, in thinking about the question of solidarity in the diaspora and making those important connections, um, maybe as a last kind of thought, could you reflect on, you know, what um, what do you want the rest of the world um, to know about what's going on in Brazil now um, and why this is so important. Um, but what does solidarity uh, mean, or what do you what do you want the the rest of the world, uh, the black world specifically, to know about what's going on in Brazil, and and what could a solidarity project look like? I think that um, the reason why uh, the assassination of Marielle Anderson uh, took uh, the pages of newspapers all over the world and, and also the social media is that for one. Uh, nobody could expect that in 2018, Brazil would have uh, this kind of situation, for one. But I think what struck a chord in every single corner of the world is to understand that Marielle represents uh, thousands of women all over the world, black women all over the world, black communities all over the world. And that is something that put all of us together, not in one unique side, one unique context, but we are part of a singular context. We are part of a, sing uh, a singular process of oppression. And that has been going on for centuries. So it's important to understand when the escalation of violence reached that level, all of us, we are threatened in one way or the other. So it's important, the solidarity, yes. It's important to understand our pains cross border because we are part of the same process that started, I mean, in 1500. So we have to think about it, you know, whether, uh, uh, whether we have to um, converse, exchange, plan, uh, plan strategies of uh, surpassing moments of violence and destruction in our societies. So solidarity is the key word to understand how the, the singular phenomenon is took accord all over the world. So it's important to that. You know, we have to remember people that before us also said the same thing, like Abidias Nascimento, like Lélia Gonzalez, like uh, Luisa Bairros, uh, Beatriz Nascimento, and many others, Oliveira Silveira, that always talked about the importance of solidarity to be able to overcome and to understand the possibilities for the future. And so that's what makes us to think about it, you know. I couldn't have imagined a better way um, to end this conversation. I want to thank you so much, um, Dr. Vera Benedito. I think you have pointed to what is an important um, political moment for Afro-Brazilians um, at this particular moment um, in the struggle 
for black lives. Um, and I think that this conversation also points to the fact that this is an, a, an important political moment for the broader global struggle um, uh, as it affects um, black people across the diaspora. Um, as you stated, um, we are part of the same process of oppression and we will certainly be part of the same global process um, uh, in terms of a struggle for equality and change. So I want to um, end our conversation by thanking you very much for um, speaking with us today. Um, and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Uh, I should be want to thank you. Uh, thank you, James, for the opportunity to be able to voice um, a little bit of my thoughts about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Again, we'll be in touch soon. Okay. Muito obrigada. Nada. <laughs> That's it for Africa World Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms. Email AfricaWorldNowProject at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at AFWRLD. NWPRJ. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalist, executive producer, and human rights activist, Mwizi Matali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent, Funda Ngunda, senior research, content contributor, and production director, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, senior researcher, and content contributor, and production associate, Dr. Josh Myers, associate producer, and content contributor, Dr. Keisha Khan Perry, technology advisor is Byron Gray of Grayworks Technology and creative director is Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project is heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC NPR affiliate and broadcasting service of Winston-Salem State University. Shows are archived weekly on SoundCloud. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be Direitos, não tem direitos. Mulheres pretas aqui não tem direitos. Não tem direitos. Preto aqui não tem direitos. Não tem direitos. Mulheres pretas aqui não tem direitos. Não tem direitos. As imagens feitas por um cinegrafista amador são fortes. Uma mulher está pendurada pela roupa no porta-malas do camburão da polícia militar. O corpo é arrastado pelo chão por cerca de 250 metros. A mulher que estava teoricamente sendo socorrida por policiais é Cláudia Silva Ferreira de...